Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to lecture. Today, we have as guest lecturer Alec Rafford from OpenAI. It's a really great honor to have him here. Alec has been a pioneer in many sub areas of uh, deep learning already. Um, we covered GANs. The original paper on GANs was Ian Goodfellow and collaborators, but then the first paper that actually made it look like real images was Alec's work in 2016 with DC GAN. Um, then from there, Alec went on to you know, write a paper on how to improve training of GANs. Um, then uh, he actually worked on PPO, worked on, um, started working on language models mm -hmm. uh, about two years ago, I think. Yeah, two, two and a half now. Two, mm -hmm. two and a half years ago. And in those two and a half years, he's built the world's state-of-the-art language model. And we'll tell us a little bit about his journey in his last two and a half years. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alec. Yeah, so my kind of core interest is just broadly in unsupervised learning, so it's great to be here. This is like the perfect class, uh, really excited about it. Um, you know, GANs and language models, kind of how do we learn from images, how do we learn from text. And so today I'll kind of be talking about uh, language models and their uses. Um, so I guess we could start with the fun stuff that gets people's attention, samples. Uh, so this is from Oriel Vinal's uh, Twitter, Twitter, and it kind of shows a brief history of kind of the improvements, particularly in deep learning language models, over the last uh, 10 years, particularly. So if you go back and wind the clock super early uh, with uh, a three gram language model, this is a, a very simple language model that only considers dependencies between like the last two or three words. Uh, you get basically something that maybe makes a tiny bit of local sense. So they also point to $99.6 billion from two, but it doesn't really go all that well together. Um, and then you have kind of one of the first uh, kind of character level language models, uh, Ilya Sutskever's work in 2011, uh, really trying to go big with prompting with the meaning of life is. And it does this pretty weird and funny thing, the tradition of ancient human reproduction. It is less favorable to the good boy for when to remove her bigger. So it still doesn't make sense at all. Um, but that's kind of where this stuff was because language models, as we'll kind of discuss, are incredibly computationally intensive. It's a very difficult to model space. And only recently are we really getting some of the tools down to make a crack at this problem. So the first, the first paper to really make that kind of happen was this paper from Rafal uh, in 2016. That was basically a big LSTM. Um, and this got us finally to something that looked approximately like coherent sentences. So with even more new technologies coming onto the market quickly during the past three years. An increasing number of companies must now tackle uh, the ever-changing and I believe repeats itself ever-changing environmental challenges online. So this like at the surface level has like with the right grammar, but if you really start to dig into this thing, you see some weird stuff going on. Why are there environmental challenges online? Uh, why did it repeat itself ever-changing and ever-changing? Um, and then, you know, kind of with continuing progress over the last few years, we've now gotten to the point with uh, systems like GPT-2 that we'll be discussing a bit today uh, are getting to the point where they're kind of starting to write longer term coherence. Uh, you can still see, it, particularly if you poke into any of the details, there's this great blog post from Stanford that kind of really goes into the same way I did that with this uh, sentence here, kind of tearing apart all the details. These things still aren't there yet, so there's this weird stuff like it's a four-horned unicorn. You can give it this prompt, this kind of fictional story, like finding unicorns talking uh, hidden in the Andes Mountains, and it'll kind of try to make a new story out of it. Um, but some of the details still aren't quite there, even if the global context now of like the style of a news article is now there. So samples are cool, and they kind of you know, show a great amount of the progress and why we're so interested and excited uh, in, in this space in the last few years. But kind of what I really want to talk about today is kind of uh, the broader kind of picture of what's going on here. How do we use these systems uh, in both generative context, i.e. You know, cool samples, and also in discriminative or downstream for basically any task. Um, so yeah, the highest level statistical such probabilistic language modeling is kind of interpreting language as just a high dimensional discrete data distribution, which we want to model. Uh, I think there was a lecture 1C kind of that talked a bit about autoregressive likelihood based models. This is basically the way I'm going to present it today. Um, so at the highest level, you want to observe a bunch of strings of language, and uh, that would be your data set. And you'd want to learn a function that can compute the probability of new ones. So you, know, you could ask, what is the probability of the sentence? Is it going to rain today? Now, it, it, it is a little weird to ask this question. Like, what does it mean to compute the probability of a string? You know, 
what should the probability of the cat sat on the map be? It's, uh, I don't know, you know, one in a billion? How many sentences are there? You know, this is a huge space. And, you know, rightfully, some people would say that, you know, this is maybe not the most meaningful concept. So, you know, Noam Chomsky back in the late 60s, now this is so far before we really kind of established modern statistical learning all that well. So at the time, he was quoted famously saying, but it must be recognized that the notion of the probability of a sentence is an entirely useless one under any known interpretation of this term. So he'd argue that this is nonsense and we shouldn't be doing it. Um, now, this was before we really had the machinery in place. There really weren't language models back then. We really didn't have the framework together to do this. And you know, I think maybe if you interpret this as under any known interpretation of the term, it's pretty rightful. But it does express this kind of skepticism about what is this concept? Why would we want to compute the probability of a string? What does that even mean? How do we use that? But I think if we quickly think about it, uh, there's actually a huge amount of value uh, that we could do if we had a very good function uh, that could compute the probabilities of strings. So I'm just going to kind of hand wave here and say we're going to imagine there's some sort of uh, kind of optimal language model somehow. Right now, we're not going to worry about the details of how we discover it. But these are kind of some behaviors we might have. So we would like that you know, it assigns a higher probability to the sentence the cat sat on the mat then it assigns to the sentence the cat sats on the map because that's ungrammatical. Um, but then there's the question, should the probability of that be zero? Probably not because, I mean, it really depends on what the distribution is that we're, we're talking about. Uh, you know, if we're modeling text on the internet, people make grammatical mistakes all the time. So this ultimately should be understood as a question within a context of a data set. So you can imagine very well that this probably shouldn't be all the way at zero just because people make mistakes. People you know, write weird stuff sometimes. But it should probably be pretty small, and it should definitely be a lot smaller than you know, the grammatical sentence. Um, another sentence we could have is the hyena sat on the mat. Um, and we would expect that to be a lot lower than the cat sat on the mat just because from a world knowledge context, we know hyenas aren't really like house animals and don't really have a lot of mats available to them. Now, maybe you could say, OK, it's a hyena at the zoo or something. But in general, this kind of gets at something like world knowledge. So a very good language model should begin to tell you kind of what these different sentences are, how to rank them. And then you, you have more questions like, should the probability of the token 4, given the conditioning string or prefix, 2 plus 2 equals, should that be 1? Um, well, you know, people like to joke 2 plus 2 equals 5. So maybe this really depends on more context. If you're unsure of the context, then maybe it should kind of blur probability mass out and say, well, I don't know if the previous sentence was, you know, in George Orwell's, you know, uh, 1984, you know, the party, you know, jokes about 2 plus 2 equals 5 or tries to force people to believe that. Um, and then finally, like one of these ones that I think kind of gets at more where I'm going to be going today is this final one. So we could give it a prefix. Uh, that movie was terrible, I'd rate it. And a good language model should assign a low probability to, you know, or sorry, this is, that movie was terrible, so it should assign a high probability to the sentence or the completion one star out of five. And this would be like sentiment analysis. Now the interesting thing is this is a language model. It's just kind of modeling strings of text. And, you know, I'm kind of saying that it's this nice, beautiful function that does a lot of really useful things. Um, but you can see just how flexible the probabilistic framework is. We can do conditional probabilities, and we can get you know, potentially useful downstream systems out of that. You know, so much of what we care about in machine learning is basically just conditional probabilities. And you, know, you can rank things. You can score things. So this would be an incredibly valuable and incredibly useful function if we could, if we could learn it and if we could express it with a model. Um, and I, I'd like to say that we're now finally making a lot of exciting progress towards actually having systems that begin to do kind of this broad suite of functionality we might desire. And, you know, that was kind of one tiny example at the end there of maybe a practical task with sentiment analysis. But you can use these probabilities of strings to do a ton of things. So tasks like speech recognition and machine translation are traditionally viewed as supervised tasks. You would, for speech recognition, kind of have these sets of audio transcript pairs. And you would just you know, supervise learning. So you have an x and a y. You collect a bunch of those. You have you know, probably way more than three, hopefully. Otherwise, this isn't going to work too well. Um, and you know, for machine translation, you might have pairs in one sentence and the other. So the major promise of language modeling here is pretty much to leverage a bunch of uncurated text to try and help with these problems. So we're only ever going to be able to collect so many labeled pairings of data. And this is already a very difficult task for speech trans recognition. You have to have kind of transcribers sit down and do this process. And you know, learning a language is a pretty difficult task in and of itself. 
Um, but we'd like to develop systems that might be able to you know, use this ability to score the probabilities of strings at kind of the highest level to assist with these tasks. And so kind of the details of how you could do that a bit more so are in something like speech recognition. You could prune the space of possible transcripts. So you'd have some acoustic model that takes in the audio of the speech and produces some you know, possible uh, transcription of it. And a very famous example that kind of illustrates where a language model might come in is the speech signals for recognized speech and recognized speech are very, very similar, but we kind of know it's far more likely to be recognized speech. One, from the context, we're talking about speech recognition. And two, this is just probably a more probable string in the English language. Um, and then in machine translation, we could re-rank possible translations, or we could do some more complex integration directly with the decoder. Uh, there's kind of a huge space here, but this is setting up some of the motivations for, especially where classically, tr uh, language models were used. These are kind of speech recognition in particular. What we'll see as we go kind of forward is a lot of the early language modeling papers were actually published in speech recognition venues because this is kind of the first real practical task that they really took off in. So the motivation, you know, to back out a bit is, you know, there's a whole internet out there. There's so much information out there. We want to learn, be able to learn from it. And a perfect language model kind of of that style that could assign all these nice properties to probabilities of strings it would have to basically somehow fit or compress the entire internet into its parameters. Uh, this is going to suggest that we're going to need a lot of parameters, we're going to need a lot of compute, and we're going to need a lot of data just to get as close to that kind of function as possible. Scale is kind of another way of saying that. And to motivate that a bit more so, if you have you know, maybe even a very good language model, like a char and n from a few years ago, that would have been pretty competitive with some of the best you could do. If you have a very tiny one with, let's say, 10,000 parameters, it still basically just writes gibberish. You can give it an infinite amount of data. You can feed it the whole internet. And it's just not going to be able to fit all that information in there. Uh, and kind of the reasoning here is that even classical resources like WordNet, so this is, we'll talk a bit about WordNet a bit later, but it's pretty much this hand-designed kind of mapping of all of the interrelations between words, which words are synonyms of other words, which words are antonyms of other words. And that was manually created and curated, and it's already 5.5 million relational features. The package, when you unzip it on disk, is 55 megabytes. So by context, a lot of language models we were training up until a few years ago often would be on about that scale. So I'd like to argue there's just so much information out there that we're really just going to need very large models. And then finally, there's this concept of language modeling as primarily ungrounded language learning. So what do we mean by ungrounded? Ungrounded here means that we aren't really connecting it to any other signals. We aren't looking at you know, images. This isn't like ca image captioning where we have you know, the visuals to associate with the text. It's kind of just seeing these sequences of symbols, these strings of data. And it's very difficult to learn from that. This is very inhuman. This is not you know, how we learn, really. Uh, but we're and that's going to result in models that kind of really can't exploit some of all this rich supervision and additional signals we learn with how we kind of exist in a physical world, whereas these are kind of passive systems that just observe strings and try to find patterns in them. So we're kind of going to need to make peace with this, and I'd argue that we'll address it with scale for now. Uh, and the other reason to be hopeful about scale is primarily there's a really interesting line of work in the last few years that's kind of really nailing, uh, nailing home that this is uh, kind of a trend that seems quite empirically valid. So there's a few graphs down here from a few different papers. Uh, the first paper is deep learning scaling is predictable empirically. Uh, has Ness et al. This is from Baidu about two years ago now. And so what they did is they took a standard language uh, modeling data set. I believe this was the billion word benchmark. And the x-axis here is just the amount of data you train on. So they took this whole data set and they kind of sliced it into uh, fa subsets of two. And the y-axis here is the performance of this model. We'll you know, talk about what the numbers mean in a bit. But you just see these very stable log linear trend lines. So you just keep adding doubling data. You get kind of constant improvements. And this is a trend that happens over uh, eight powers of two here. So these kind of trends occur uh, very stably and very reliably. Maybe there's some breakdown at the end here. Um, remains to be seen. In the middle here, we have kind of your standard canonical example of deep learning, uh, image classification on ImageNet. And if you plot all of the recent models we've been developing for kind of the last four years-ish uh, and plot them by their parameter count versus their accuracy, it basically looks like a straight line. Um, 
So clearly, you know, parameters aren't everything. I can give you a fully connected network, and it'll be on the floor here or something. Uh, so there's, there's definitely something to the architectures here. But parameters and scale and data are all very important pieces of the puzzle. And then this final trend line here is from a blog post at OpenAI uh, called AI and Compute by uh, Daria Amade and uh, Danny Hernandez. Um, and this basically just shows that over the last few years, we've had a very large increase in the growth of compute available for training systems. This is primarily through leveraging large-scale distributed training, and also in recent years, things like much improved hardware accelerators, things like Tensor Cores and NVIDIA's Voltas, or TPUs from Google. And kind of throwing all this together, we've been able to kind of get together a 300,000x increase in the compute from the smallest scale experiments to largest scale experiments over the last few years. Of course, that 300,000 exit compute is something like uh, Alpha Zero, and that's probably you know, tens of millions of dollars giant Google data centers. So realistically, that isn't available for every experiment. But it just shows that there's kind of a huge amount of compute being unlocked here. And these are kind of the trend lines, I would say, that language modeling has really been writing and is going to just be something to keep in mind during the background of this whole talk. So let's get back to computing the probabilities of strings. How do we actually go from a string to a computational model that can compute the probability of it? Uh, maybe we first do some pre-processing, like lower casing. So this is destroying information. It's no longer like really you know, correctly modeling the string, you could say. Uh, but you know, we do all sorts of pre-processing anyways. Your camera's doing pre-processing of the pixels and the input. So by and large, you can shrug and say, whatever. It probably doesn't matter too much. So we might do something like lower casing. Um, often we'll set a maximum number of words or a minimum frequency of the word for computational reasons. So if we were to work on the word level here, there's this problem of there being hundreds of thousands of possible English words. Uh, that just means there's a huge space here, and that's a huge amount of compute to kind of compare. If we're doing a probabilistic model, we're going to need to compute the probability of every possible word. Uh, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, about the uh -huh. word casing, actually. Yeah. Uh, sometimes wouldn't you lose information through that? Like, let's say you have like, proper nouns yeah. and like that. So you could actually like, lose kind of context and like, things that might be useful. Yeah, absolutely. So a trend line here kind of is back in the day, we saw a lot more preprocessing. And in the last few years, we've been seeing much less of it. But kind of starting from like the classical history here, often we did stuff like this. Um, and particularly, like imagine you had a word level model. You wanted to get that vocab size down. So if you had all possible casings or something, that would make the space way bigger. So uh, you know, what we'll see with some of the papers that we'll be covering in a little bit is just that that can be so expensive that preprocessing can actually help you there. So we'll sometimes throw in unks. Uh, this would be like out of vocabulary. So you know, maybe there's a rare word like countertop. And we'll just swap it in for this kind of placeholder token. Again, that definitely destroys information. So these aren't ideal, but this is kind of where we were coming from in the history of things. Um, and then we have this thing called a tokenizer, usually. So I, I would define a tokenizer just as something that takes a string as input and returns a sequence of tokens. Tokens can kind of be arbitrary divisions. In this case, we're doing like a word level tokenizer. So we just basically split on spaces, maybe disconnect some punctuation. And then you know, for your mental model, internally, these are all just getting assigned to kind of arbitrary IDs if this is a word level model. You know, the, and this is a good way of thinking about just how difficult this pattern matching problem is. These are just kind of arbitrary, unique identifiers. And somehow, you're going to have to build a system that can uh, assign probabilities over these and make all the relations implicit in this data actually show up and be respected. And again, this could be any form of preprocessing. So you could also go character level and just kind of chunk it up per character. Uh, this can be a quite flexible object. And there's many different ways to dice a string. So this is actually one of the, one of the not so trivial design decisions you have to make uh, if you're going to build a language model, is how to just chunk up the string. <laughs> and we kind of talked about character level real quickly. Uh, that would be like if we just throw out all the non-ASCII stuff. Uh, byte level would be if we want to work on, like say, uh, one of the more modern uh, encodings that could have emojis or things like this. This would kind of be like you work on the raw byte string under coding this. Uh, you could work on Unicode symbols or code points. So instead of that emoji getting chunked into like three UTF-8 bytes, it would be just this Unicode code point for like smiley face or something. Uh, of course, the problem with uh, working on the Unicode code symbol level is if you don't do any uh, kind of uh, vocab limitation or something like that, I think we already have 130,000 different possible Unicode symbols. So that's one of the major attractions of byte level. Character level would be uh, usually about 70 tokens, I think. ASCII is 128. Um, and byte level would just be 256. Uh, so those are very small vocabulary spaces by comparison. And then we talked a little bit about tokenization or preprocessing at the word level. And then this final trick that is 
showing up quite often these days is called byte pair encoding. Uh, so this is from uh, Sunrich. Uh, 2016, they developed this for machine translation, but it's kind of taken off in language modeling as well. And this is a beautifully simple algorithm that starts with a character or a byte level vocabulary. And all it does is it counts through your entire uh, vocabulary. So we have some data set, and we're just going to say how many A's are there, how many T's are there, how many U's are there. And we just take it, and we define this process where we take the most common occurring pair, so T and H, and we just merge them into one new symbol. We then recount, compute this again, so then we merge I and N. You keep doing this, and then you know, two steps down the line, you'll be merging, or three steps down the line, you'll be merging T and H with E, and suddenly you've got a word. Um, and so this process is kind of a, a simple statistical method of kind of allocating capacity. Uh, you can just do this process how many times you want for your vocabulary size, and it kind of naturally chunks it in reasonable ways. It's not perfect by any means, but you start getting you know, useful things like uh, the ending ing, and you know, it quickly will fill up a bunch of words. So this allows you to, instead of having these like, super long strings of you know, the the space cat, you know, common words like the and cat will probably get their own tokens, Whereas before, when we had counter top and we were mapping it to an unc, now we might split it at counter and top. So this is kind of a, a very common approach now that's used by a lot of systems. Uh, it's quite nice. It's pretty simple, but often we use it. So you will first take your data set. You'll run this kind of preprocessing step to compute your byte pair vocabulary, and then you'll just chunk it up that way. Yeah, totally. So 32,000 is very commonly used. Uh, you can kind of go anywhere from down to like, I'd say 8K is probably the lowest you see with this, and then up towards 100K is on the other side. Uh, on word level vocabularies, we'll discuss a few papers that have kind of pushed that, but the largest I think we've basically ever seen is 800,000. So this you know, would be much, much smaller than that by comparison. And you'll have to use some tricks to do something like an 800,000 way vocabulary. So yeah, so let's start simple with how we would compute probability of string. So we could just assume a uniform prior over token, so we're just random guessing. And we could also just assume all tokens are independent. So this would be the dumbest model ever. Uh, I would basically just uh, assign one over the vocabulary size. So if it's a character level model, you'll just get a probability of one over 256. And then to compute the probability of a string, you just product together all of these individual probabilities. This is the simplest model ever. Uh, so let's make it a little bit more less embarrassing. So let's fix the uniform prior over tokens. Uh, let's estimate a probability of a token or of, of a word by counting its occurrences and normalizing this count by the total number of tokens seen. This is basically the, I think in the first lecture, uh, 1C kind of talked about a histogram approach, and this is pretty much that. Uh, and then you still are just kind of producting together the probabilities of each individual token, and that's kind of factorizing the probability distribution here. Uh, and, but we're still assuming all tokens are independent. So this is called a unigram language model. This is pretty much the earliest language models that were used in the 70s. And slightly more complicated model would be to kind of start having uh, kind of conditional probabilities here, where we would now estimate the probability of a token conditioned uh, on, let's just say, in this limiting case, one previous token. And the way we would compute the probabilities of this is we would count how many times it co-occurs with that previous token. And then we would normalize this count by the total number of occurrences of that context token. And now we would have, you know, for the first, we'd probably have to back off to Unigram model because we wouldn't have any context. But then we could compute the probability of token two, you know, uh, cat conditioned on the word the. And then, you know, token three, we can compute, you know, the probability of uh, sat conditioned on cat. So this would be kind of factorizing the joint distribution uh, into kind of this product of conditional probabilities. And this is that autoregressive family of models, the likelihood autoregressive family. Uh, and this is using. Uh, counting pretty much to estimate it. So this is a bigram language model. Now there's a problem here, which is generalization. So let's say we get some funky word like self-attention, or you know, given a context that's much longer, like the cool thing about, you would never have seen this word before. So if you had naively normalized with this way, you would just have you know, a probability of 0. And if we took a new data point, we would just have infinite log loss on it. And that's no bueno. So the simplest thing you could do is smooth things out by using a mixture model. So we could define a mixture between some model that assigns uniform probability over all tokens, i.e. that dumbest model. And maybe we just put like a kind of fallback 1% probability uh, mass on it. And then we would, by and large, use the Unigram model. And this was pretty much what most language models for the 80s and 90s were doing. 
there are a huge amount of these ways of kind of how do we better estimate, how do we better smooth, how do we better interpolate uh, what are called these n-gram language models. And a great summary paper of this kind of, uh, kind of at the end of the era here was this uh, Joshua Goodman paper from 2001 up on the archive. I didn't know archive existed in 2001. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a great overview of this whole space. If you're interested in kind of learning more about all of these different smoothing techniques, there was really kind of a huge amount of work developed on kind of how we make this all well behaved, how many you know, different ways we could do these techniques. Uh, and this is actually a great overview of kind of where that line of work got. So what do we do? How do we evaluate language models? How do we know one is good versus another? Uh, so there's some things to be worried about here, maybe. Uh, probabilities are often within rounding error of zero. You know, you product together a bunch of probabilities, and suddenly, if you have a long string, uh, it, you'll just have something that's basically 1e negative 38 or something. So language is a huge space. Uh, you know, some would say it's an infinite space. So this is kind of a difficult problem to deal with. So the most common quantity we use is the average negative log probability per token. And again, token here is kind of an arbitrary placeholder for it could be a word, it could be a character. It's really up to you to decide, kind of as we talked earlier, how you could chunk this space up. So character level language models, by convention, we use base two and we report this metric called bits per character. So you, you, you might have seen this before if you looked up like uh, the Hutter Prize or NWIC 8. Uh, this could also be reported per byte. That would just kind of be one little uh, piece of housekeeping you would take care of. And then word level language models, like this kind of n-gram models we talked about, report instead in perplexity, which is an exponentiated version of that working just in natural log. So how do we ground these numbers? And this is one of those things that I find quite difficult, is like, imagine you just spent three months working on a language modeling paper, and you just, you know, you pushed it really hard, and now you have 1.21 bits per character versus 1.23 bits per character. Uh, what does that mean? And it's kind of important if you just spent three months of your life working on it. Like, I might have not done this uh, sometime two and a half years ago. Uh, so these quantities are, of course, data set dependent, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, it's really easy to guess all zeros. It's really hard to guess you know, papers from the archive or something. Uh, and you know, one way to ground this and kind of just start to get you thinking through kind of what the space looks like and what numbers kind of lie along here is random guessing gets you just log to uh, you know, the uniform. So you'll get eight bits per character. That's kind of just random guessing. And the current human estimate is somewhere between 0 0.6 and 1.3 bits per character. Uh, the best models now are a little bit lower than one bit per character. I think we're probably getting down to about 0.9. So we're you know, a good chunk of the way in terms of compression from these original models. And you know, you've talked a bit about compression, how you could use a uh, generative model to do that here. So now you're getting these factors of about 10 in terms of compression over the raw naive version. So that's, you know, progress is being made. Uh, you know, maybe we're still a bit of a ways to go from that human estimate. But these are kind of very vague, difficult to nail down values here. Question? Yep. How do we know like, the human estimate for that? Uh, so, I think the way this worked, I don't actually know the details here myself, is you could imagine that you do a guessing game with people. Uh, and you would say, you know, given the previous characters, yeah, I mean, you could just ask them to assign probabilities to the next characters. Uh, of course, I think humans tend to be poorly calibrated. And, but you know, in the limit, you could ask them to just be the function for the language model and to say, well, do you think it's 40% that it's a character A? Um, and I think it turns out that humans are just bad at guessing. You know, they'll put zero probability on something, so they'll get a terrible metric. And I think there was a slightly clever way to kind of use like relative odds or kind of a, a, betting, a betting game to smooth this out. Uh, but it's quite difficult to get this estimate. And it would be actually be a great contribution to the uh, field to just get much tighter estimates on this. Another thing you could do is you could kind of use hybrid systems. So you could start with what already is a very good language model, and you could kind of bound it based on that and have humans refine it. You know, we're basically working down to what the uh, like fundamental entropy of, of the data distribution is. Uh, and of course, these are data set dependent, so I don't know if this is calculated on some book that's super famous. So it's really hard to say. So for perplexity, it's uh, you know random guessing would just be the vocab size because we kind of uh, just pop it back up to that space and. Uh, you know, it's an exponential scale, so keep in mind that these numbers get big, and then they kind of start shrinking down near the end as you kind of crunch away. Uh, one way to think about perplexity is kind of as this branching factor of language. So the perplexity to, you know, the nth would basically be the space of possible generations of length n. So let's say we're
Awesome. OK, cool. Yeah, so I guess uh, picking back up where we left off, uh, I just discussed kind of some of the work on kind of unsupervised representation learning for sentiment and some of the work that we, we've been doing in that space, kind of analyzing representations and kind of hopefully helping to understand and explain some of the work found by uh, Dai et al. in 2015. And so I guess to continue with kind of cool uses of language models, like this is kind of one of the things that over the last two or three years has really kind of bloomed out and flowered, has been all the different ways we can use them. And so this is a great example of one that I think is really cool. So this is the story close task. Uh, this is a data set called Rock Stories. Uh, and what it is is it's these little kind of common sense everyday stories. So, you know, you might have a roommate in college and you go to a concert and you have a good time at the show. And what the task is set up as is to predict the right versus the wrong ending of this uh, kind of uh, story. So this relies on some pretty long range context. You need to look at a whole last paragraph of information and you kind of need to reason about what the normal like everyday life events would be that would cause kind of uh, this scenario to happen. So, you know, it's likely after a good event that you would you know, become friends, uh, and it's unlikely that you know, if you had a great time, you would suddenly hate someone. So this kind of gets at a bit more common sense reasoning, kind of, and a lot of this kind of more world knowledge stuff. And so this was a very difficult data set when it came out, and this is partially due to the fact that there's only about 2,000 training examples. You, know, you can imagine it's kind of difficult to get Turkers or crowd labelers to write these stories for you. So you don't have that many training examples. Now you could have plenty more of like stories. You know, you could scrape blogs. You could kind of you know look all over the internet for these kinds of like uh, kind of uh, piecemeal style stories. Uh, but in terms of like generating these you know possible endings and supervision of like what the right narrative structure would be, there's not a lot out there. So you saw that when this paper when this uh, work originally came out, the best systems were at about 60% accuracy. And what they did in this paper from Schwartz et al. Um, uh, Roy at UW. Uh, sorry, my <coughs> excuse me, my voice got a little messed up there. Uh, they took a language model, just a simple LSTM, they ran it over the story, and they just checked the probability of the ending uh, given the context, and they also normalized by just the kind of uh, unconditional probability of the ending. So this gets at one of the issues that we have in language modeling, which is uh, surface level features like uh, how complicated the sentence is, or whether you use a weird or difficult phrasing, are mixed in just as well with like the actual important information. So you might say the right thing, but if you say it in kind of convoluted language, you might still be low probability according to kind of this overall uh, kind of just probability score. And so you can think of this normalization they're doing here of kind of looking at the probability of the ending, kind of uh, the ratio of it conditioned on the story. So you would expect that to be much higher uh, when it's conditioned on the story. Um, and you can kind of normalize it by uh, just the probability of the ending in isolation. Uh, and so those aren't features just by themselves. There's a much larger supervised, unsupervised uh, kind of 100,000 or so stories. Yep. Uh, how do you actually compute that accuracy? Like you have like a set of endings that are possible and you just pick the right one? Yeah, so you have two possible endings and you have to pick the right one. So it's just a binary oh, classification okay. task. So it's already like quite, you know, like we're not a lot better than random for these baselines. Um, and so that R and N that just, you know, as a language model that just scores uh, conditional kind of uh, how likely is that string given the context, it's already bumping up accuracy significantly to like 67%. Um, and one of the things that this paper showed uh, uh, was actually some kind of uh, difficulties of kind of data set bias here where it turned out that also just things like sentiment and whether it was happy ending or whatnot uh, could also be very important. So that was what these stylistic features are. So we can't like 100% say, yeah, what's going on here is the RNN really understands world knowledge or common sense reasoning and you know, thinks uh, the correct ending is way more likely because it actually is. Uh, you know, there's, there's some confounders here. But you know, if you combine these two together, you get another good bump. So this is a really cool example of kind of dealing with a long range dependency problem and also dealing with kind of a uh, problem that you could imagine, you could design like a, if, uh, you know, a huge space of these kind of common sense stories. And if you're trying to train a supervised system from scratch to do this task, you would just need so much data for all of the relations to kind of be captured here. Whereas a generative system that might be able to go off and read you know, thousands of people's uh, you know, like stories and see all this other text kind of maybe is a way to make progress here. So this is kind of using a generative classifier effectively and kind of leveraging just a really strong generative model that can compute <laughs> Uh, you know, good conditional probabilities, kind of just reusing that system in a supervised setting. So this is kind of, I think, a, a very cool and very inspirational perspective for a lot of the more recent zero-shot work with things like GPT-2. So on the scaling side, you know, we've talked a bit about why scale is important. Uh, 
Noam had this paper called the sparsely gated mixture of experts layer, which is kind of ridiculously cranking up the parameter count. So I think it was called outrageously large neural networks originally. Uh, and they were able to push the parameter counts to 137 billion parameters. So maybe you could begin to put a good chunk of the internet in, into that. Um, now the way they do this is with uh, kind of this sparse uh, uh, gating mechanism. So you would have, you know, let's say you have your standard uh, LSTM uh, hidden layer and you'll have a fully connected layer and you'll have a bank of these. So you might have 128 of these different uh, like small fully connected networks. And this gating network will decide which of these is relevant for a given data example. So maybe you just saw a noun and it'll use a specific fully connected network here. And now if you have large batch sizes and good balancing over like this gating network so that it uses all of these uh, fully connected networks kind of approximately equally, uh, you can do this huge parallelization. You could have you know, all of these different ones. You could imagine uh, kind of you could route to all these different processors, all these different subnetworks. And you know, the way you get tons of parameters is by having hundreds or thousands of these like experts. Um, and they're squeezed in between your standard dense LSTM layers. Uh, so, you know, per equivalent compute, it was performing much better than the equivalent dense models. And there was a lot of really impressive systems work here on how you make this system work. And it's kind of a good example of one of the first times you see a model that's designed not only to uh, do well at the task, but also to utilize available <laughs> compute and resources in kind of an efficient fashion. This is really cool work to see. And then this is kind of where everything took off. So this is called Deep Contextualized Word Representations from Peters et al. This is AI2 work. Uh, it's colloquially known as ELMO. Um, and the core idea here was to replace word vectors uh, with a learned weighted sum of the features from a deep bidirectional language model. Uh, and so what they use is they reuse that Rafal's paper from 2016, that Exploring the Limits of Language Modeling paper. They pretty much took that model that was developed in isolation. It was just you know, made to get better perplexities. And they were able to show that this actually uh, was computing in a ton of really useful information. So instead of having word vectors in isolation, uh, what you would do is you would instead replace it with these you know, weighted sums of you know, the word vector plus like the Ford, LSTM. And by bidirectional, we mean there's both an LSTM that processes from left to right uh, and a LSTM that processes in reverse from right to left. That's to give you context from both the future and the past. You know, our standard autoregressive uh, factor re requires a factorization or ordering over the variables we're predicting. And usually we just use a left right kind of model. So, you know, it makes sense that you could go in that order. Turns out it's equally easy to go in the reverse order, um, but that's kind of a limitation. So, they kind of sandwich together two of these models that they train independently after the fact. And the way they do that is by computing a weighted sum. So, in contrast to something like Die et al., where we did this fine tuning step of the full language model. Uh, in this paper, they say, we're just going to replace the word vectors we might have fed in before, like glove, to some task-specific architecture uh, with kind of this weighted sum. So now instead of having word vectors be kind of uh, you know, just these input features learned by you know, maximizing the dot products so that they match like log co-occurrence counts, you'll have like all of these hidden units in an LSTM, which as we saw before with something like the sentiment unit, might be doing really interesting things. You had a question? So they just train two different language models independently. So they'll have a forward language model like the, in the standard way. They'll also have a backward language model. And this kind of makes it look like they're interconnected somehow. It's just a bad visualization. It's actually two independent uh, 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 language models going in parallel. And they're both two layer models. So we have kind of these, uh, I guess, a total of five possible uh, like vectors that we could pull from. And so what they did in Peters et al. was they learn these weighting sums of how they combine these different layers. And then they, instead of presenting the word vector or word representation as the input, they'll instead present this contextualized representation, which kind of includes this much broader context. And so this really kind of, uh, when it came out, like these are kind of crazy numbers. So Squad was like this super competitive data set. It was one of the first major reading comprehension data sets. And uh, this is an F1 score, so it's kind of like a fuzzy accuracy metric. And I think human level was about 90. Uh, and so what they're able to do is take simple systems that kind of didn't have a lot of task engineering, were kind of considered the baselines. And they would just swap the standard word vectors out for these contextualized representations. You would get like a plus four F1 improvement. And usually SOTA on this data set kind of improved one F1 at a time. And there were just so many papers published that it like ramped up from like 65 to 80 in a pretty quick period of time. So this like really made everyone's head turn.
Um, and this kind of works across the board. And one of the cool things you see is that with something like Elmo, uh, it'll use different weightings of the different layers for different tasks. So if you have a low-level task, like maybe it's just like, is it a proper noun or something, or part of speech tagging, it might use lower-level features. Uh, whereas if you have something that's like maybe more high-level or abstractive, it might use you know, the RNN features instead. So there's also interpretability. And as you might expect, these kind of are more useful in very low data regimes. So you know, if you have enough supervised data, you can do anything in the limit of you know, infinite supervised data or something. Um, but in the super low data regime, we kind of see really strong benefits, like plus 10% accuracy on like, uh, SNLI, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Oh, shoot, I left in that slide, sorry. Um, uh, so GPT-1 was kind of a follow-up uh, to Elmo, where uh, Elmo is still using a uh, LSTM-based language model. And it's still using these task-specific architectures. And so this is kind of a, a, a necessity because for something like question answering, you have incredibly long range dependencies. You might have multiple paragraphs of information you need to process. And in LSTM hidden state, you know, as you saw in the Rafal's paper, we were just barely getting models that could handle single sentence dependencies. So at this time, if you would try to do something like question answering uh, with a model that used an LSTM, it just wouldn't remember information over a long enough context to actually do all that well. So what you'd have to add is a specialized architecture on top. And one of the core components of these specialized architectures is pretty much self-attention or attention layers. Um, so we'll talk a bit about what a transformer is. And uh, with GPT-1, this is a paper where we just trained a transformer-based language model. So it looks a lot closer to kind of what we knew were these uh, uh, very uh, performant uh, state-of-the-art systems. Um, but it's using kind of the same setup. So then we can just directly fine tune it for the task. Uh, and we're able to remove the need for task specific architectures. Uh, so this is kind of the diagram of how we would do various tasks for GPT-1. So GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Uh, it was named afterwards. We didn't give it a name, but someone was like, it needs a name, so they did it. Anyways, um, so if you have something like classification, you could just feed in the text. Uh, you would just run it through the transformer and it would predict a linear layer. You'd add linear layer on the end, kind of die it all style. Um, if you have entailment, so this is a relation between two sentences, just concatenate the sentences, run it through the transformer, predict. If you have sentence similarity, um, we did a little bit of like hacking here to make it work a bit better, but you would just feed it in uh, in order one with like the first sentence and the second sentence, uh, and then you would feed it in the reverse order with the second sentence and the first sentence, just because this is still a left-right language model, and so it has kind of this uh, ordering bias issue. So we kind of balanced that out by averaging forward, averaging together, processing both ways. Uh, and then for like something like multiple choice question answering, uh, you could just feed in all of the uh, context, like the document you might be trying to predict, uh, the, uh, and then you would feed in the possible answers, and you would just have it uh, you know, go through the transformer independently, and then it would kind of predict an unnormalized log probability of how likely it thought that answer was correct. Um, so this is nice because we removed the need for uh, kind of these task-specific architectures. There's still a little bit of task-specific engineering going on here. Uh, but now we're able to just kind of use the language model again. And we're seeing a much more diverse set of tasks that we're able to approach. Uh, so whereas Dai et al. was kind of just doing primarily text classification, um, and this, unfortunately, I forgot to finish this slide. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up work to Dai et al. that like really pushed it much farther, called OMFIT from uh, uh, Howard and, and, and Reuter. Um, we're able to, with uh, GPT-1, begin to handle like these much more varied uh, tasks like uh, question answering and sentence similarity and entailment uh, that hadn't previously been done with kind of this fine-tuned language model approach. And if we look at what the representations learn, so this is a 12 uh, self-attention block model, uh, has about 100 million parameters, so it's starting to get a bit bigger. And uh, you know, we can look at how performance, uh, what the performance is as a function of the number of layers. So in the limit, we could uh, transfer no layers at all, and that would be random initialization. And this is kind of tracking task performance on two different data sets, race, uh, which is a question answering data set, and multi-NLI. And you can just see that performance steadily improves as we transfer more and more of these uh, self-attention layers. So there's clearly a lot of useful functionality being learned, and it's distributed throughout the network, uh, and kind of your standard, hopefully, story of deep learning, you know, deeper is better, and you know, more generic usable representations higher up. It kind of hand-wavy matches at that. And one of the really cool things at this point is, so we've talked a lot about how you can just like score the probabilities of strings and use that for downstream task. Uh, and so what that's really exciting is it kind of allows you to do zero-shot behaviors. So what we mean by zero-shot is in, in the limit here, there's no supervised learning at all. We're just like the same way that for Roy Schwartz's work, uh, you could just go ahead and just say, well, language model, compute some conditional probabilities for me and tell you whether you think this sentence is more likely or less likely. 
Uh, for something like sentiment analysis, you could just see whether the language model thinks the word positive is more likely than the word negative after reading the review. Uh, so there's no you know, standard supervised learning doing, going on here. We're just kind of reusing the ability of the model to compute conditional probabilities uh, to do stuff. And this graph kind of shows over the course of training how, this, how, the, how these uh, zero-shot performances uh, improve. And you see, you know, kind of, it's a little noisy. You know, this is zero shot. There's no kind of fine tuning at all. So we're kind of getting a kind of raw look at kind of some of the capabilities of the model that it's learning. And the final interesting point to note here is we also trained a baseline LSTM of the same size. And uh, in most cases, it had significantly worse transfer performance here. And in particular, this is especially noticeable for something like question answering, where it pretty much never does better than random. This is a normalized task performance, where zero here would be uh, random guessing, and one would be the current known state of the art. So these are all much slower. You know, In many cases, they're only half of the performance of a supervised system. But there's no supervision in the traditional sense of like curate a labeled data set, tell it what to do. Admittedly, there's a little bit of that going on. Like we still figured out how to do this for the system. So there's a little bit of that. You know, I'm using a validation set and I'm looking at how well it does. Uh, but this is kind of showing that these language models begin to, you know, just be able to compute a lot of interesting conditional probabilities. And so much of what we do in supervised learning is just compute conditional probabilities. So you know, this is a quick overview of attention. Uh, if you're not too familiar with it, uh, kind of the standard formulation we use right now is uh, a query, a key, and a value. So the query would be here, you know, conceptually what you would want to look for. A key would be what you could compare to, and the value would be the information you can retrieve. So you'll do this kind of combination operation where you know, if we have the, the word the, you know, it's like the what. So it'll query all the other words in the sentence. Uh, and you could just use a dot product between the query and the key as kind of a similarity operator. And it might find that you know, it, it heavily responds to itself and also you know, to the uh, key value for the cat. So you know, now you're like, OK, it's the what, it's the cat. And then you would return the value, which would be uh, another, another vector representation, uh, which would be a weighted sum. Usually use a softmax to normalize these, so they're kind of just a weighted sum. Uh, and you would just say, well, there is a high response to the query on the cat vector, so I'm going to return the value vector uh, at, at that location. Uh, and then this kind of gets scaled up in a, in a transformer, which is kind of this much larger uh, kind of uh, set of, of kind of how you use self-attention. Um, this is for translation here. So there's both an encoder processing in one language and a decoder processing in the other language. You can kind of, for language modeling, just cut off this encoder and just say, OK, all it's doing is there's a, there's a decoder that does self-attention. So it just looks back over the previous locations it's processed. Uh, and kind of the combination that they use here is there's this mask. You need masking because it's an autoregressive model. You talked, I think, in the first lecture a little bit about pixel CNNs and how you do that masking. It's the same thing here. So you'll have this like kind of attention matrix, which is just this kind of all-to-all -all connectivity pattern. And you'll just mask out all of the future locations. So you just set the logit. So you might, uh, in, the, in the underlying implementation, you might actually compute queries and keys with respect to all these future locations. But you'll just set them to zeros. Um, so that's this masked multi-head self-attention. So what is multi-head? Multi-head is that there's not only just one of these comparisons being done. So the softmax normalization kind of is a, is a comparison. But it's also kind of restrictive. It only allows you to do a weighted sum. So what they'll do is they're paralyzed over multiple comparison vectors at once. So let's say we have like a 512 dimensional vector. We'll split it into eight 64 dimensional chunks. And we'll do self-attentions independently over each of these chunks. Uh, so you know, there's Qs, Ks, and Vs. And you'll do you know, the matmul to do the comparison. There's a scaling operator here, which just kind of keeps track of kind of the scale of these dot products and makes them well behaved. So you know, your softmax doesn't collapse to a sharp one hot attention uh, or something like that. And then you have a softmax to do the normalization, like we talked about. And then you do the final comparison with the, uh, to do the weighted sum over the values. So that's kind of packing all the way down into the details of a transformer. So that's this uh, masked multi-head self-attention. Uh, and what you would do is you would get the output of the system. Uh, you would concatenate back together what all those kind of self-attention operators did. Uh, you would then project it back with like a linear layer uh, onto a residual stream. So it's a residual network. Uh, they had layer normalization in here. Uh, in between each of these operations. And then one thing to note is that like, this is kind of a relatively simple operation. It's just a weighted sum. So you'll also add these uh, fully connected layers, uh, which are just MLPs. So those are kind of a little bit more ex expressive. They kind of just do more arbitrary computation. And we kind of will interleave these two. So we'll do self-attention MLP, self-attention MLP. And this is kind of this chunk here together is called a block. So GPT-1 is 12 of these stacked on top of each other. 
Uh, GPT-2, which we'll get, eventually get to, is I think 48 or 60 of those. So there's a lot of those. Um, and there's this one final little detail, which is positional encoding, which is this model kind of independently and in, in parallel processes all locations. It doesn't have any sort of temporal kind of uh, uh, processing baked in by default, like an RNN. It doesn't go left to right and read a word at a time. It just kind of does this all to all comparison. So that doesn't really have any sort of information ahead of time to know about where a location is. So they also inject these like position encodings that let you know, hey, I'm at position one, or I'm the first word in the sentence, or uh, kind of let you have that information. So you get these cool like uh, laser light show visualizations where you can look at kind of the what the self attention patterns will do, and you can kind of see that there's some interesting structure going on here, and even you can see some cool stuff like uh, kind of you know this would be a difficult sentence like the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So what is the word it referring to here? Is it referring to the animal or the street? So if it's you know we know that streets can't be tired because uh, you know an inanimate object can't be tired unless you're some really poetic person or something. Uh, so you know that means it must be animal instead that it is referring to. And you'll see that the self attention weighting is much higher for animal here. Uh, by comparison, uh, down here, if you say because it was too wide, uh, you'll see street uh, because you know animals. Yeah, I guess it's just we much more talk about crossing streets and them being wide as a problem. So it's kind of showing some cool kind of you know details of like kind of being able to do language processing in kind of this cool weird way with self attention, uh, and kind of yeah. So that kind of just shows like a complicated phenomena that could show up in the encoder of a translation model, for instance. So how do you get those sources? So how do we get what? How do you extract those then? So these are visualizations from uh, Vaswani uh, Ashish's original paper, uh, and these would just be you would look at the self attention, the query key kind of dots. So that would give you, you know, how similar this, this query was to this key. And you would normalize those with the softmax. And you would just extract them. So this visualization is showing for a given set of two words kind of how high the query key dot product was for them. Um, so that's kind of showing how it does comparisons. And kind of this gets you a little bit of a sense of how you could stack a bunch of these and do a bunch of complicated routing of information through a model and potentially be quite expressive. So GPT-1, oh, yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right that with one layer, it all be processed independently, and you would have no idea. So you know, this is kind of polysemony would be another way of saying this. Is bat could mean you know the baseball bat, or it could mean the flying animal bat. So hopefully the lower layer, like you could imagine that the first layer might do like a very local self attention to just kind of like look at the context that the word's appearing in, and maybe it could learn with through a combination of like the MLP layer on top, it would like modify its embedding you know representation of bat to be more like the you know the baseball bat if it saw like you know uh, it was the six inning or something. Um, and if it was like it flew, you know, maybe it'll update its representation to be more like the, the animal bat. This is, of course, kind of heuristic. But there's actually some papers that have shown that these models do very well at uh, uh, kind of word sense disambiguation for understanding. Uh, so it does look like they do that kind of operation through deep layers. Yep? Why is it for the GPT model you only require the decoder block and not the encoder yeah. block? Yeah, so that's just an efficiency trick. You could have a separate encoder block. Um, but the encoder was primarily coming from this translation sequence to sequence background, where usually you'll have two independent things. Um, and the other thing that's nice about an encoder block is in translation, you might want to do like bidirectional representations. So your encoder can kind of look both at the past and the future because it's just it's not having to decode, it's not having to generate, so we don't have to worry about respecting like the future information, masking and assigning an ordering. Whereas the decoder only models are like language models. We have to generate left to right, or at least the standard autoregressive model assumes an ordering. And so that means that we just kind of just use the decoder. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of a just different, different tool, different place. So GPT-1 did very well on a bunch of different downstream tasks. And they were kind of spread across a different, bunch of different categories. So self-attention architectures were quite nice. And kind of language model pre-training together with them uh, does quite well. And you know, you, there are ablations where we train the model from scratch. And so even though this is a very powerful architecture, um, by default, it's quite difficult to get it to uh, work as well without pre-training. Um, so maybe there's just some detail of initialization we haven't figured out yet. But things like zero-shot performance suggest that there's really something going on here beyond just uh, you know, something as boring as just fixing your init. <laughs>
Yeah, so I unfortunately don't think I have that in my slides here. Um, on Glue, I believe we, with GPT-2, Glue benchmark is at 72 here. Uh, and the previous sort of was like an Elmo style LSTM at this point. Um, I think without any training, it was about, or without any pre-training, it was about at 60. So it was even much lower than uh, Elmo and some of these previous systems. So Glue is an average over seven different tasks or eight different tasks. And so, so, so the the exactly the same, just whether you copy the parameters over from the language model or randomly initialize them. Now, I'm sure if we did a lot of tuning, you could get those numbers up. But kind of if you use the exact same setup we use for training the language model and do supervised learning and just like sweep over your learning rate, um, it doesn't work nearly as well. Yeah, so that was one other detail. That's a great question. We, uh, during training for this, uh, we actually have an auxiliary objective here. So uh, there's both the text classifier uh, hooked into the end, and then there's also the auxiliary text prediction objective. And what we saw is we did an ablation uh, where we had that on or verse off. And for very large data sets, it helps to also do the generative training on the downstream task. But for very small data sets, it's kind of just injecting noise and doesn't really seem like it does much. Um, so OMFIT, that one that unfortunately I forgot to finish the slide for, I'm not sure why it didn't get copied in, they did a three-stage process where they first uh, do the generic pre-training, then they do a data set specific training. So if you know you're going to do this target supervised task, you then do kind of customization in the generative sense on it, and then you unlock it finally in a third step for joint uh, fine-tuning. Uh, but with uh, GPT, we just kind of do both together. I think we just set the value to 0.5, we didn't even tune it, just kind of threw it together. Yeah. So the baseline results from the language model parameters, does that also do a split on the uh, target task? Um, I don't think that comparison was done. Uh, that would be probably give you a decent bump there. Uh, doing joint training definitely would help from scratch. But I don't think we actually included that in that ablation. So that's something we probably should revisit. So the final kind of point on the story here is BERT, which is uh, kind of pointing out one of the weaknesses of a language model in this like autoregressive left right uh, factorization is it only can see context in the past. So imagine we have a task that's comparing two sentences. Uh, when you're processing the first sentence, you have no idea about what that feature sentence is going to be. And now that's great for efficient training and for you know assigning a valid normalized probability distribution over things, but that's probably suboptimal for a downstream task. For classification, by default, you would want a model that could like look in the future or look in the past. Um, and so what Bert did was kind of said, okay, well, how important is that? And it turns out that that's uh, quite important. Uh, so Elmo had been previously doing this kind of fusion thing where you train a forward and a backward, and then you combine them after the fact with weightings. Uh, but what Bert does is it jointly trains it, so it abandons the standard language modeling objective. It's not trying to assign, you know, it can't actually pro properly score a sequence. But what they do is they just randomly mask out input tokens. So they'll just take 15% of the tokens in the sequence, and they'll just set them to a special mask token. And they'll say, OK, just predict what was at that location. Um, and so we'll have to use local context. Uh, if you're familiar with classical uh, kind of unsupervised deep learning, this is a denoising autoencoder. So it's a denoising autoencoder kind of back from the past. Uh, and it works incredibly well when done with the transformer architecture. Um, and they were able to see much larger gains over uh, GPT-1 by kind of using these bidirectional uh, representations. And you know, the other thing that they did is they started scaling these systems. So they added in kind of a lot larger models and really saw kind of that that continued to help things. So kind of that's the core of the presentation in terms of kind of going through the history of language models. Uh, there's a little bit here kind of quickly talking through uh, kind of some of the arguments for why I think unsupervised learning is so interesting. I know Ilya gave a presentation, uh, so he kind of said some of these things. So if we want, I could just quickly go through this, or we could also call it here, whatever uh, would be preferred. Um, but sure, yeah, totally. So quickly, I'm going to go through a task called SNLI, uh, or, or natural language inference, and the Stanford uh, NLI data set is one of the major ones here. This is about predicting a logical relationship between two sentences, a premise, and a hypothesis. And there's a, it's basically phrased as a three-way classification problem. There's entailment, so this is when there's a, uh, uh, basically a correct inference uh, about the first sentence in the second sentence. So you know, a soccer game with multiple males playing, this, it's correct to state that some men are playing a sport. Uh, for neutral, uh, you, have, you have just kind of an irrelevant statement. So you know, an older and younger man are smiling. Two men are smiling, a cat's playing on the floor. We don't know if cats were involved. Uh, 
It's not a contradiction because there's no evidence to tell against that in the first sentence. And then contradiction would be a man you know, inspects a uniform, uh, and that's not possible if the person is sleeping. So uh, on this task, kind of, it was a large-scale data set, 400,000 labeled examples. Uh, sometime last year or two years ago now, uh, nominally, we reached human level. Always put quotations around that. Um, and so this ESIM architecture gets about 88%, and you know, the original Turkers got about 88%. So you might say, great, supervised learning is really working well. Why did I just spend an hour talking about all this unsupervised stuff? Why do we need it? Um, now, there was a lot of really interesting work done in the last two years, kind of picking, up, picking apart kind of where this performance comes from. So there was this, uh, Suchin had this paper last year where they kind of looked at the construction process of a supervised learning data set. So you'll often, you know, you'll pay crowd workers to create labeled examples. Um, and you'll have like a, a, a guide for them. You'll say, here's an example of positive. Here's an example of negative. And, you know, it turns out often they're paid quickly to generate these data sets. So they'll often pick up on a few heuristics or kind of simple details that would allow you to like, oh, I'll just throw a not in there and that'll give me a negation example. Or, you know, oh, a, a generic word will hint at entailment because you're kind of just like generalizing the statement or rephrasing it. And then a modifier might be like adding additional detail, so it's probably neutral because you won't know it for sure. So if you just train a classifier on the second sentence, and again, this is a task which correctly should involve reasoning about the relations between two sentences, you can get twice the accuracy of random. And then if you evaluate on the hard examples, i.e. the ones that this classifier gets wrong when it's not really solving the task but might be explaining some statistical biases of kind of the generated training data, ESIM drops like 16%. Um, and there's another version of this done uh, around the same time by Glockner, uh, where you could take kind of a bunch of known relations, like a man is holding an object and a man is holding a different object, and you could just brute force through all the combinatorial pair or all the pairs here. So you know there might be 100,000 different objects, so suddenly you have this you know tens of millions of size space here, and you could just kind of go through and check: do you get this one right? Do you get this one right? Do you get this one right? And this kind of gives you an example of why supervised learning can be so difficult. Is we really want models that have strong generalization properties, but if your only source of supervision is kind of a few bits of information of like this one's entail, this one's negate. That's like a really difficult task, and you just need so much data, particularly with a, you know, as complicated thing as natural language, to get through this. And so likewise on this, a uh, system like eSIM drops quite a lot here. Um, and then this also is a story for question answering. So you'll take a squad question answering system that's near SOTA, that BERT model, that does really well, and you'll just run it on a different data set, and it'll quickly fall apart. You know, it'll have its accuracy. So this is kind of a standard picture to some degree we know right now is that deep learning systems might do very well on IED data, but if we push them a little bit and throw them out a little bit farther from their training data, they're not really learning the data set quite the problem as well as we want. They're kind of exploiting some biases or details. They're not truly generalizing. So you know, there's a lot of reasons this might be going wrong. We kind of talked through some of them there. And so the question is, how do we make progress there? And you know, I would argue that this is kind of uh, uh, an interesting update that we've been seeing in the last few years here, where originally we kind of spent a lot of time thinking about how we would find these architectures that kind of would let us impose high level structure and information on a task. So you know, we know oh, it's about images, so we're gonna add some convolutions. We kind of developed and got into this mindset of playing with kind of architectures. And we were really able to push quite far on encoding useful information about task through kind of picking these details like convolution and recurrence and weight sharing. And kind of this was a lot of what the last five years of research were really about. Uh, and, and we made a ton of progress here. And, and I would say kind of maybe a mental model of what's going on is this is kind of like uh, a picture. You can imagine this is like task space. So, you know, maybe translation is over here and question answering is over here. And then, you know, maybe uh, natural language inference is kind of this little area here. And this is looking at the performance of a system. And so right now our systems are basically these kind of isolated peaks through this space. You know, we train them in a supervised fashion, we just pour more data on it, and kind of what we're doing is we're making that peak high, higher, i.e. we're just getting better on the benchmarks, we're pushing the leaderboard, or we're hoping to widen the, out these hills so we get better generalization. And so what goes on when we do these kind of checks where we like do some of these downstream evaluations with like uh, kind of Glockner et al. or Suchin's work is we just shift a tiny bit from the top of this peak, just a tiny hair for people, but we already fall a far amount down because we're not really generalizing right now. And so this is, I think, one of the important challenges we're really going to have to figure out going forward. Yep. Kurt, uh, can you explain what that peak is? So yeah, this peak would be just an abstract representation of like performance of a model. So a high location would be the model performing really well on a task. Uh, and like kind of the plateau would be like random guessing, like not doing anything at all. Um, and you can think of this as like covering the space of all possible tasks we might care about. So a general language system 
like a truly general linguistic intelligence or something like that, um, would be some system that would be 100% or you know, uh, at this yellow peak of accuracy everywhere across this whole grid. But right now, we usually do supervised learning, and we train on one of these systems in isolation. And you know, we hope with enough data, kind of it widens out. But it's kind of naive to expect an uh, entailment system to eventually like, learn how to translate. Like, that's probably just not going to happen. So this peak is never going to kind of cover the whole space. Uh, and so this would be, you know, I'd say, one of the interesting directions we want to work on as a research community is how to widen that space out. Um, and you know, some of the work in recent years has begun to question some of the details of kind of this method of engineering better architectures. Uh, so this is a very important paper from about a year and a half ago where uh, Gabor Mellis and a few others kind of took standard LSTMs and benchmarked them against some of the very new, uh, down, you know, better engineered systems that we'd hoped were kind of details of improving language modeling. And what they had found is the accuracy, if you tuned uh, the baseline LSTM well enough, was exactly the same as some of the more complicated architectures. And if you run a, a crazy complex self-attention model with all the bells and whistles, it's not actually a lot better than an LSTM on this data set. And that's primarily because we're limited by uh, capacity and we're limited by data in this setting. So maybe architectures aren't quite, uh, we've maybe squeezed out a lot of the near-term improvements we're going to see from that, particularly with smaller data sets or things like that. So this makes you think about what the value of architecture engineering would be. Um, you know, in general, we've brute forced most problems. The dominant story of deep learning is with supervised learning. So, you know, the biggest data set ever is JFT 300 million, at least that I'm aware of. 300 million image classes, it's 18, or 300 million images, 18,000 classes. So if you just kind of product out that, it's about 530 megabytes of constraints. That's not actually a lot of information. All of Wikipedia is like 50 gigabytes of text. So there's like supervision, this is basically Jan LeCun's argument with like the cake slide, is you know, there's only a few bits of information in supervision. And we're going to need to learn to use all these other bits everywhere else. Um, and I tried this route for language. So this is a good example of a failure. Um, I spent most of 2015 trying to build what I hope would be the image net for text uh, to enable impactful transfer learning. So basically, I came up with this giant weekly supervised data set, which is 20 news groups, which is this classic. You took like uh, kind of news, news groups from like the old uh, uh, message boards before like the internet was really fully a thing. And you just said which one is it is. And in like, uh, you know, the tech news board or the sports news board. So you kind of get weak labels just by classifying what communities conversations are having in. I trained these uh, you know, large models at the time to do this classification task. Um, and then we would hope it would transfer for downstream tasks. Uh, Dai et al. had just come out when this happened. So we're hoping maybe we get additional headroom from using supervision to help guide and learn the representations. And it turned out it actually did worse than Dai et al., uh, which is kind of a weird and interesting point to just keep in mind on the benefits and trade-offs of supervised versus unsupervised learning. Um, we got really excited about it, and then layer normalization came out, and it turned out it wasn't doing a lot better than just adding layer norm in as a better initializer. Uh, so this stuff doesn't always work out from a supervised perspective. Question. Yep. Uh, so the GPT-2 paper mm -hmm. mentions that you have to create some metadata, and they yeah. actually do a lot of pre-processing. Uh -huh. uh, so like, uh, is that one of the uh, like things you have done from the like, perspective of Canada? Or yeah, in the past. Yeah, so a huge amount of the work back then had been on how the pre-processing was done and kind of just the data quality so all over the place. And that's one of the problems with supervision is you have to have high quality clean data sets. So you've got to try to find as clean of data as possible. And, you know, that still is a problem for unsupervised learning as well. You know, if you just feed it random bits, it's, you know, random garble strings, it's never going to learn anything useful. Um, but it's hopefully a lot less sensitive to it. Um, so you know, I think one of the interesting questions that we're going to think about going forward as a field is how we move more towards something that looks like this in task space. So kind of how do we get a system that kind of covers and performs well across the whole space? And I would argue that this is kind of more about information and representation engineering than necessarily about architecture engineering. It's much more about how we kind of use, learn about the world, find information, kind of get it into our models, and make it so that it's accessible for downstream task um, instead of kind of maybe some as much of the details of uh, kind of how you structure these models. So this Kim et al. paper, or sorry, Kim from Chen uh, was kind of this paper that did this with WordNet, one of those classical resources. So what they did is they took this entailment task, which again is all about comparing the relations of two words or two sentences, and they augmented it with these additional uh, information signals about whether two words are synonyms or antonyms. And this is kind of an example of, you know, uh, kind of a little bit more richer uh, Help, uh, richer helping of information than just maybe a pure word vector. And that helps a lot. So on that kind of uh, common or that like kind of difficult test set of just swapping in all the different objects and words, you can imagine that the system that can leverage WordNet, it generalizes a lot better. 
And you know, word vectors also, we see those big bumps there. So that's another classic example of this. Um, and you know, it hasn't really been figured out yet, but with like recent work like Cove, Elmo, GPT, and BERT, we've kind of been seeing a lot of progress here. And the interesting thing here is again that um, you know, something like BERT is basically sewed on everything, but it's just a stock transformer. There's not a lot going on here from like an architecture perspective necessarily. Now, it's, a lot of it's because the transform architecture is maybe quite good, um, but kind of a lot of this task-specific engineering that we used to see is no longer helping as much, and instead it's more about transferring information. It's more about how you design these pre-training processes so you learn well from data, and I think we're going to just see more and more of that going forward. Um, yeah, um, you know, so I, you know, I think one of the takeaways here is uh, instead of manually specifying what we want to predict through the creation of large supervised data sets, which has been kind of one of the dominant ways we've tried to learn so far, you know, we should instead be focusing on figuring out how to learn from and predict everything out there. So you can think of every time we build a data set as basically setting the importance of everything else in the world to zero and only everything in the data set to one. And you know, our models are still so terrible. They still generalize so poorly. They know so little and we hide so much from them. So I think we're going to you know, continue to figure out how to make them kind of see a lot more of the information in the world and kind of you know, move more in that direction. Uh, and that's kind of the core of the talk, yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, if there's GPT-2 specific stuff, I could chat a bit about that. And I have some slides, but that's basically it. I don't want to hold you too much. Oh, sorry, I forgot that stuff. Let me go to it real quickly. Sorry, there's a lot of stuff here <laughs> that I didn't get to. I'm nervous because I, I said I was going to do an hour and a half, and now I'm like at two hours or a little over 2.15 now. So I'm, I'm, anyone should feel free to leave, but uh, there's a little bit here. Uh, so yeah, w some of the takeaways here are kind of performance is not usually limited by something a single paper fixes. Um, you know, so, so you saw some of those works where it's like, oh, data's the problem. We're just going to tile the whole data space and get every Amazon review ever written. And then you get capped by uh, model capacity. Or you know, uh, with like GNOME's work, push parameter counts a ton. But there's just so much compute you would need to do that like every parameter was being used less. So even though it, it definitely was more efficient per given level of compute, uh, compared to like later work, we know that you could actually use far less parameters far more efficiently. Um, so one of the takeaways here is kind of just be pragmatic about your scaling to kind of combine a lot of tips and tricks together. So a great example of this is that is Rafal's paper from 2016, the exploring the limits of language modeling. You know that combines these character level inputs with kind of this important uh, sample softmax, and you know uses this projection LSTM, and that you kind of see more of this combination of a few of the tips and tricks of the trade. And hopefully over today I kind of talked about a lot of these various pieces of design that kind of you can keep in mind, um, and then. You know, usually it's just kind of we're always getting you know Amdahl's law, Amdahl's law here, where anytime you push on any one ask, access, you'll get bottlenecked on all the other ones. So you've kind of got to push on all of them together potentially. Um, and the other thing is just like don't do research on large scale models. You know, I know something like GPT-2 is impressive, but it's going to take forever to develop on that. So what I like to do is prototype on models that are about ten times smaller and as a result ten times faster. Um, and so GPT-1 has all of the pieces of like the GPT-2 paper showing up. You get zero shot transfer. Um, I guess the one here is maybe the language model transfer isn't quite as obvious there. But if you retrain GPT-1 on the web text data set from GPT-2, um, you'll see that it, it actually is on some of these data sets already zero shotting to state of the arts on like language modeling task. Um, so we work on these much smaller data sets. And in general, if you're only going about an order of magnitude, that's a, you know, all the scaling in machine learning is basically log linear. So even though an order of magnitude might seem like a lot, in practice, that's just really your next step up. So most results, I'd say, uh, carry over and are consistent on about that level of scaling. So you can kind of confidently work on this slightly smaller scale. And if you see interesting behaviors there, you kind of develop, you try out your experiments. And then at the end, you huck off the final model run. So like with GPT-2, my co-author Jeff was doing like a ton of the amazing work on like really scaling them systems. Um, and kind of uh, some of my own work was more on the like kind of uh, initial prototyping and kind of analysis work. So that, that's a good combination if you can find it. Um, and the same strategy was used for that sentiment unit paper. You know, that final model was a 4,096 dimensional LSTM that took a month, but the original one was a 512 dimensional LSTM, which was basically a char RNN, and that took two days on like two GPUs. So you know, was, that's, that's hobbyist hardware at that point. And you already was, we already were seeing that it was doing something interesting for this kind of task. Um, and usually you'll get free accuracy at the end, you know, compute and data help. So uh, if you can do well at smaller levels, you'll probably see further improvements from higher level. Of course, this can go adversarial. So if you go like two orders of magnitude or something, you might see things break down, and then you just kind of there's no free lunch. So with uh, a system like GPT-2, uh, 
if you make deeper and deeper self-attention models, it can be tricky to train them. And uh, uh, so, you know, even though all my initial development was done on these like 12 and 24 layer ones, like GPT-1 style models, um, it turned out once you made them deeper, they just stopped learning better, they stopped scaling. And so whenever you see like these log linear lines break, it's usually a sign that something's going wrong. Uh, you know, that I would trust that scaling line more than most of, you know, your own details in Experimenter. So that's maybe, you know, if it, we don't know for sure, but that's probably a sign that there's some detail to figure out. And so Rewan, one of my co-authors, was kind of the person who came up with a better weight initialization and a kind of a modification of one of the details of how normalization was done in these networks. Um, you know, and these models are big now, so you've just got to be efficient. Um, you, you know, there's just going to be a ton of memory being used here. So tricks like weak computation, this is where, uh, so in standard training of these models, you kind of cache all your activations in a forward pass. And then in your back pass, you kind of peel them off and you update and you get a gradient for every parameter as you go back. What you can do is you go like five steps and then you cache uh, kind of every fifth or every, you know, every other activation. And then what you can do is in the back pass, you, one, you have your memory if you just cache every other thing. And in the back pass, you go back down to the last cached unit. You do a mini F prop to re-get the intermediate states. And then you roll back. And then you go back, you do a tiny F prop, you know, and you just do this process over and over again. So that can save you a ton of memory. Um, and that's like one of the core tricks to getting these very large models working. Uh, half precision, so voltas and TPUs, uh, that just uses half the memory. Um, and then data parallelism is the final one, but this is a scale one, so it's not as likely in uh, kind of in, in all settings. It's just you can go to batch size one, um, and you could just have a thousand <laughs> different. Uh, uh, you can still have batch size a thousand, but it's over a thousand GPUs instead of you know, and each one's only doing batch size one. Uh, that one's kind of an act of desperation that admittedly is only available with certain resources. Uh huh. So Yeah. So this is one of the problems, and I think one of the good counterarguments to likelihood-based generative modeling is a huge amount of the information is in local statistics. Uh, so you know, if you're doing like a, a pixel CNN or something, uh, and the pixel CNN plus plus paper, there's these cool ablations um, in it where they train pixel CNNs that only look at like a five by five field, and kind of the same result shows up where you only get a very little improvement from the very long range information. So we know that at least in terms of all of the bits, a huge amount of them are kind of stuck in local noise and kind of local statistics, and not too many of them are in these long range pieces of information. And so that would be an argument for why this stuff is really difficult and maybe why we need so much compute is your model will kind of greedily always try to optimize that objective. If you have too small of a model, it's going to spend all its capacity on the smallest bits or the smallest range statistics that are giving you the greatest gain in bits. So you kind of have to brute force through all that boring stuff of all of the local memorizing your, you know, oh, this word comes after that word kind of stuff before the model gets any gains from the much rarer events like learning how to like reuse the name of a person across a document. Um, and I think that's part of one of the reasons why uh, for many years this stuff didn't look as promising was it was, you know, a likelihood-based objective that's biased towards short-range statistics. And you're absolutely right that there's not all that much going on in the long-range information. Um, but, you know, self-attention models are promising exactly because they can in a single step look, you know, 500 or 1,000 uh, locations in the past. So kind of ahead of time, they don't really assume as much of that local dependency structure. Whereas an RNN that chunks and updates its state every time step is going to like kind of implicitly uh, or just be biased more towards doing local processing. Um, so you know that's an example of where uh, you know there's that zero shot GPT one visualization showing the transformer doing a lot better than the LSTM. You know one way to fight it is exactly with architectures, and I think Pixel Snail and some of these other uh, ones have kind of really discussed and shown this kind of behavior as well. Uh huh. Uh, question. Um, so you said earlier like that you expect less improvements coming from architecture, but more mm -hmm. like from how we like give information to the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering, is yeah. that like the whole point of deep learning that like you don't have to engineer those? Yeah. Yeah. So I was showing that to be like a form of architectural <coughs> engineering for information, and you're right that it does come off as a little bit like over designed. But the thing to note is that GPT one. Uh, performs just as well as that kind of hand-engineered architecture. So uh, yeah, I, sorry, I didn't make that connection as clear. So I'd argue things like language model pre-training look much closer to kind of the way we might get information into our models. And one of the beautiful things about language is it's a communication interface. 
So, you know, something like a GAN, like Big GAN knows a ton about the world. There's so much information in that system, but it's all tied up in the weights, it's all tied up in the activations, and we still don't really know how, as a community, to get that information back out. You know, it knows what dogs look like, admittedly it's a conditional model, but it also knows that sky is above ground, you know, and, you know, the gr green grass is green, and there's, like, so much information in these systems, but we don't quite know how to make it out, get it out, or to use it for downstream tasks. Whereas for language, we have this interface that just lets you you know, hopefully in the limit, you know, if you had a language model that memorized a fact, it'll be incentivized to, you know, whenever that fact co-occurs or is useful, uh, it'll be incentivized to surface that information and extract it out of the model. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why this stuff is kind of working better in this space right now. Uh-huh. Uh, so one thing that you kind of classically told was like larger and larger architectures uh -huh. are overfitting. Yeah. So why is that not a problem in the scale-up or is that something that you have to like have yeah. some so it is a problem, but uh, you know, this is a lot of the promise of unsupervised learning, is we, we aren't as limited by data set size. So for supervised learning, where it's very expensive to collect your pairs of data, uh, that's a very difficult problem. You know, if you're paying someone to generate every single labeled example, you know, overfitting is a huge issue because you can only get so many. But uh, you know, a language model on the limit can work on any arbitrary piece of text. So uh, you know, a standard supervised data set might be 400,000 labeled examples. SNLI, I think if you look at it in terms of like just megabytes of text on disk, is like one of the larger language processing data sets. Squad would be another big one. There are only about a few tens of megs of text. Um, but we know on the internet there's probably hundreds of gigs of high quality information out there. So that's like so many orders of magnitude up on the scale. Um, but we're absolutely kind of skirting around the generalization issue and just kind of brute forcing it with large amounts of data and large models. So there's a huge amount of efficiency to be had. You know, widening the peak is very much what we want to do as researchers. We want to have models that generalize better. And instead, this is kind of like the brute force approach of like having tons of tiny peaks everywhere along the data or the task space instead of making them wider. So that would be, I think, where the promise of architecture engineering still is, is to truly help with widening those peaks. Um, but maybe it's going to be a lot more difficult. And a lot of the generalization just seems to be a fundamental problem of uh, information and knowing about like the relations between objects and entities. Yep. Um, you know, so writing efficient code would be one example here. So like GPT-1 took 25 days on 8P6000s. Um, uh, that, you know, is really difficult to do research on. <laughs> and it was largely because I was actually just being inefficient about the coding here. So Scott Gray is, uh, is uh, this great GPU developer and researcher at OpenAI as well that kind of came in after we did that paper and kind of helped sit me down and be like, here's all the dumb things you're doing. And uh, kind of after going through that with him, uh, you could squeeze that down to a factor of 10 faster. So particularly when you have limited resources, you need to squeeze all the compute out of the hardware you can. Um, and you know, this breaks down to a bunch of different things. So one of these is this block sparse library from Scott, which has kind of optimized primitives for a lot of TensorFlow ops. Um, so drop out normalization and activations. You can just drop these in. You know, it's just an import library. And you can just swap these in. Now, mainly, it's only on Voltas right now. So you'll need, tensor, you'll need uh, Turing or Volta architectures to use this stuff. But it'll be a lot faster. So just being efficient. You know, turnaround times are so important for research. You can just wait forever. So making sure your code's as efficient as possible is just, uh, can be really important there. Um, you know, in terms of sweet spot for compute, for a 4.1080 Ti desktop is still about that. If you have to pay for it yourself, it's still $7,000. So that's not cheap. Um, but most results from something like GPT-2 can be done on that hardware. And if you've got someone else paying for it, 8 million hundreds, it's a pretty great spot there. Um, you know, scale matters. Uh, you know, if you're working on the super tiny data set, 1,000 people have published 1,000 papers on Penn Tree Bank. Probably language models are completely tapped out on that data set. Um, so most of my own research, I would describe over the last few years, has really been pushing at new data sets and trying, you know, these things where maybe, you know, like I don't know if anyone had published any, or they had been published papers on like this Amazon reviews data set we used for the sentiment unit thing, um, but they kind of used it in a different way or for a different reason, like maybe they used it for a computer vision task. Um, and so I find that, you know, it can be very helpful for yourself as a researcher to just look a little farther afield and to, you know, not just run another model on CIFAR 10, but to go, you know, build your own data set or go find something new um, and kind of play around there. And, you know, kind of if you just take a medium plus language model and try it on a new data set slash domain, it's probably going to learn some interesting things, but it might take some digging to find that out. So being close to your code is important here. 
Um, at least that would be my own perspective. You know, being comfortable loading the thing up in a Jupyter notebook and ripping out your middle layers and visualizing things and kind of keeping, you can miss a lot of things if you don't really poke at your models. And if you only look at these summary metrics like perplexity or accuracy on the downstream task, that can hide so much information. Um, so I'd kind of also just encourage kind of ripping things apart and really digging through them and kind of, you know, going beyond just like, MNIST or CIFAR 10, where everyone's benchmarked it 100 times. It's great for learning, um, but you know, I'd say they're kind of like uh, you know, hills that have been mined out or you know, something like that. Um, you know, and you know, be pragmatic. If, don't, don't be too ideological about things. And if something isn't working, uh, it's better to recognize it and to try to figure out how to work around it instead of like, sticking to your guns and, and not changing things. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. Uh, any other questions or anything? Oh, yeah, that's just a quick thing saying that, uh, uh, you know, in the next few years, we'll just continue to scale. Um, you know, it's a, we'll probably be able to turn these things on a good chunk of the internet, and you might as well throw in millions of books. Um, so the question is really, will these scaling trends continue? And if they do, I think, you know, we'll see something similar to this picture play out. So this was progress in GANs over the last four years, summarized by Ian. Uh, and you could see that kind of, you know, for the first year or two, you know, like kind of, it's just been a steady, consistent trend of improvement. And you know, maybe that's going to happen for language too. So you know, maybe something like GPT-2 is like 2015 or 2016 here. Um, and you know, maybe this could be a highly impactful thing you know, if we had coherent long-term text generation. There's a ton of useful applications and a ton of you know, like potentials there. But it's potentially you know, uh, a, a big change. So you know, we might want to start preparing for if that is one possible likely trend line of development here start thinking through that today and kind of adapting to it. And it'll probably feel unsatisfying though. You know, if the way we make this work is it reads the entire internet, I mean, I think that's cool, but you know, I think if you're wanting something that looks more humanistic, this is very artificial, artificial intelligence. Like this is brute forcing things with compute and scale and you know, you know, playing with the fact that you can have a thousand GPUs reading a thousand different web pages at the same time and somehow that works. Um, and you can just share your gradients and sum them up and still make progress. Um, but you know, if you are driven, and I think it's totally fine if you are driven by like, how do we get more human level intelligence or something that looks more like that. Like this is as deep learning, as artificial as it gets. And it might drive a lot of local progress, but it's clear that there's still a very long ways to go. And so I wouldn't, you know, I, I think it'll feel unsatisfying. You know, I think it'll be cool, but it's clearly not the right way in quotes to do this. Um, and so a lot of other research I unfortunately didn't get to cover with like grounded language learning, you know, RL based uh, kind of, you know, interactive learning, uh, you know, the active learning. There's a huge amount of other exciting research areas that maybe not aren't hogging the limelight quite as much as some of this stuff right now. Um, but this is kind of, I think, a local greedy kind of next few years kind of thing. And it doesn't really seem like if your true goal is to like understand intelligence that this is maybe the right way to do it. All right, hope that was helpful for you all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk for any more questions. Oh, yeah, Jonathan? Uh, could you talk a little bit about simple things people can do to make their physical models faster? We have this one slide on Block Sparse. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit more details here. Don't use the built-in TF data parallel. Um, so there's that model towers example. Uh, that thing is just very slow and inefficient now. It's doing everything, uh, or it's trying to do everything within a single process, and that's just inefficient. So MPI is kind of you know a much nicer way to do things in parallel. Um, so you'll have you know different processes all kind of processing different subsets of data independently, and since they're able to use different cores, they kind of aren't blocking or locking as much. And then you can use highly customized kind of uh, communication primitives like NVIDIA's Nickel All Reduce Library uh, with MPI to do much more efficient. So I think if you just literally take like let's say an eight GPU uh, LSTM language model, and you use the naive TensorFlow data parallelism kind of approach, uh, I think you'll get about a factor of four speed up. But if you quickly s swap in like MPI plus nickel, you'll get closer to six or seven even. Um, uh, using custom hardware now is pretty important. You know, this is a pain because uh, half precision training can be unstable. Uh, there's a few tricks and tips here for you know, knowing it. I think NVIDIA has a great blog article uh, that kind of recommends a loss scaling. So you just kind of, because you're, you're working in like FP16, this is half precision, uh, the range is much more restricted. So instead of float32 having, I think, a range of like 2 billion, um, uh, for FP16, you have a range of 65,000. And uh, that's just so restrictive, it's very easy to overflow this and have precision issues. Um, so what they do with loss, and then it's also just like you have a lot less bits of precision about all the, the, you know, the details. So I think the lowest numerically representable value is just like six zeros or seven zeros. 
or I'm not quite sure. So I, I'm probably messing some of this up still. But um, so you can use loss scaling to kind of eat more of that dynamic range, but you can't eat too much of it, otherwise you'll overflow. So there's kind of this dynamic loss scaling where you're basically uh, kind of messing with your precision dynamically to try to use as much of the dynamic range of your uh, underlying uh, float rep representation. Um, so that's a huge part of it too, is that's like 3.5, which is the vast majority of this. So you know, using V100s and using them efficiently is like a good win if you can do it. But for certain architectures, it's difficult. So if you have something like a ResNet, um, there's a huge amount of just activations in that model. Um, and kind of you can get bottlenecked by bandwidth. So one of the problems with modern accelerators is just bandwidth is so restrictive. And what I mean by bandwidth is that's basically communicating between host and the device, so, and, or even within the device itself. Um, so it's, you know, hardware is designed to do these MATMLs super efficiently, and you know, they have crazy high theoretical flops now. You know, a, a V100 has like 160 teraflops or something. But if you actually benchmark out what you're getting, oftentimes, you'll be closer to like 30 or 40 T flops, and like a hyper-optimized model might be up near 60 or 80. And a lot of that's because of bandwidth issues. It's just so difficult to move all the information around the chip, and you know, you have to have very specially designed architectures to use kind of those dense mat moles. And that's actually transformers do very well at this because they have basically every operation within it is a mat mole and it's all parallelizable. Um, you know, you can do every single one of those dot products in parallel um, instead of like an uh, RNN where you have to chunk every time step one at a time. Um, and so that's part of it too is some architectures just use data more or use the hardware more efficiently these days. Um, let's see, I don't think I had too many others here. Um, you know, devil can be in the details. Initializations, you can think your model is doing well, and then you just have that stuff kind of messed up. So there's no real great advice there, but just kind of, you know, you just play around with these models a lot and kind of question every route where might my performance be hidden or what might be hurting the model. Um, but there's no easy answers there. Yep? Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Um, so GPT-2 is one of the biggest models uh, that's like trainable without crazy customization. Um, it's 1.5 billion parameters. So a parameter by default is represented in float32, which will be four bytes per parameter. So that's six gigabytes of memory just to have it fit on your accelerator. So if you have a V100 with 16 gigs of RAM, you only have 10 of that left. If you have an older card, that might be all of the card. Um, and then there's other things like Atom, if you have your beta one, and so Atom will keep these running means and variances of the gradient. Um, those would be another float32 copy. Um, so quickly, you can't actually <laughs> fit it anymore on your device if you use Atom. Uh, so there's some tricks like Atafactor is this great paper that kind of uses this like factorized version of kind of keeping your, your you can't keep the means anymore, but for the variance you can keep like a row and a column mean, uh, or, and you can kind of product them together and get like an approximation of the full thing. So there's a lot of these tricks that start showing up. But yeah, naively, if you used Atom and GPT-2, it would eat uh, 18 gigs of RAM. So it wouldn't even fit on your standard. There's 32 gigabyte V100s now, but that's, an, that's, that's so that you do batch size one with those models. So that's in the limit. Uh, yeah, it's big. Uh, yeah, it uses Adafactor. Yeah, Adafactor. Adafactor, yeah. The thing you mentioned 